So good morning, my name is Paul Wallace, and I'm a staff member at the University Spectroscopy and Imaging Facility. I'd like to give a little bit of a background of the microscopes we own and some of the operations for use and applications to difficult samples. So the inventory at USIF is two microscopes, three with the TEM, and that's a tungsten, the 3400 is a tungsten emission SEM with variable pressure, and then I have a high resolution microscope, the 4800, which is called a field emission microscope with higher resolution. I also have a TEM, a 8100, which still uses film. So I'll focus on these two microscopes today. If you're interested in contacting the labs for training, please go to the website, the USIF website, to find the current member responsible for the instruments. Marley is located on 4th Street, just south of Maine, and we are in the basement in 101D. Please uh, send us an email first so we can make sure we're not busy when you stop by to visit. We'll be happy to give you a tour or arrange for training. I'd like to point out that a number of staff members have been combined onto the Microscopy Alliance. And this is a list of many of the tools on campus and shared facilities. And I welcome you to go visit the Microscopy Alliance to find out who has what tool and what instrument. We generally all work together. So if I can't help you with my SEM, I can point you to another facility that might have another SEM or a TEM. So use that as a resource, please. So electron microscopy is something widely practiced on campus. We have um, transmission electron microscopes, the more basic instrument, which I will not be covering today, and the newer tools called scanning electron microscopes. There are a number of them on campus. There are five of the tungsten class microscopes, like the 3400, three lab six filament TEMs, including the one in my lab, one field emission SEM, which is the 4800, which is a higher resolution variant, and a dual beam due on campus April 2015. The dual beam is fantastic. It allows you to both image and interact with the sample through a focused ion beam. You can carve out, you can mill, you can make TEM samples, you can cut things in half and write arbitrary features. So we're really excited to have this tool on campus. So the basics for electron microscopy start with the comparison to optical microscopy. When you're working with light, your resolution is roughly the wavelength over two. So if you're dealing with 400 nanometer light from a laser with a high numerical aperture objective, the limit of resolution is about 200 nanometers, which is what you can get optically. And that corresponds to a magnification of about 1200 X. There's a shallow depth of field with optical microscopy. So electron microscopy gives you a very broad depth of field as shown by the two um, radialarians. The top one is an optical view, the bottom one is an SCM view, and you can see that a lot more of the microscope is in, or a lot more of the sample is in focus with this scanning electron microscope. And we have the concept of things that are light, how light interacts with samples. It'll generally go through plastics and glass, so you'll be able to visualize through as opposed to things that are electron beam transparent, which are much, much thinner. So if you look at a piece of glass in an optical microscope, you'll see through it. If you look at a piece of glass electron microscope, you'll actually see the first surface and the things on that surface because the electrons interact strongly with the material, unlike light. So again, electron microscopy beats the diffraction limit for light. We can generally go 1200x with an optical microscope. With electron microscope, we can go simultaneously or smoothly through 6x, all the way down to 6x on the 3400 at long working distance, all the way up to 100,000x or even 500,000x on the field emission microscope. This gives us a field of view from four millimeters all the way down to a field of view of 200 nanometers where everything in the frame is 200 nanometers with nanometer resolution. So it's a very powerful tool and the ability to zoom out and zoom in without changing objectives is novel and is something I really like. The electron microscope is sensitive to surfaces because surfaces interact or electrons interact strongly with surfaces and there are multiple contrast modes. The top image is the elemental analysis, which tells me where the elements are at. In this case, you can see the separation of nitrogen from oxygen in a field emission device or a, a FET. And on the bottom, you can see the backscatter image, which also gives you complementary information on 
contrast from multiple levels of a transistor. So they're very good as a failure analysis tool and a way to see what is where. The key to nanotechnology, the focus is really structure function relationships. So you have a brand new material and you want to understand why that material is different, better or worse, than another material. So that's the main push towards electron microscopy. Such things as an insect, in this case, this is a local beetle donated, and you can see optically there's segments on the antenna, but when you switch over to electron microscopy, you can actually see finer details in terms of the fibers and hairs. The little pits, on the antenna are actually different chemical sensors. The ones more in the middle are carbon dioxide sensing and the ones more towards the bottom actually secrete pheromones. So there's all sorts of structure in these uh, very fine animals. The other thing you want to do with nanotechnology is study materials where their properties differ from bulk. These are generally things like quantum dots, whereas a bulk they behave metallic as a nanoparticle, they're inorganic. And things like graphene, the single layer of carbon in the sp2 geometry that is uh, currently an area of hot study. Where again, graphene is different than graphite because of the uh, thinness properties. And of course, miniaturization and biomimetics. Miniaturization is taking things like a HPLC or a gas phase chromatograph column miniaturizing it and shrinking it. So something that used to be a piece of equipment that took up a square meter of lab bench can now be miniaturized into something that's the size of a postage stamp and as opposed to requiring mains power it can be powered off batteries and deployed locally and cheaply. So that's really the focus of miniaturization is taking the physical phenomena, scaling them down, running things faster, quicker, cheaper and also the topic of biomimetics. The insect brain is an amazing thing. We can look at the locust, which was one of the smallest animals who can demonstrate the property of swarming, where there are sensory apparatus that can detect others and have a cooperative action. If we can understand the brain pathways and the connectivity of the neurons, we can apply that towards little things like the quadcopters we're all building. So it's pretty amazing that with all our fabrication tools, it's very difficult to build something more advanced than what nature is able to provide in the dirt through the uh, fabrication of beetles and bugs and all sorts of things. So by understanding these neural pathways, we can mimic them and design fantastic new things. So in general, I expect your experiments to fall into one of four groups. Generally, per people are working with macroscopic 3D objects like this um, mosquito. And you can really see that the whole thing's in focus, unlike a light microscope. So you can do detailed studies, and they're just stunningly beautiful images. The other thing is high resolution. As our tools have become better at resolving small particles, we've become better at f building small particles. So this is the microscope you need to look at small tools. The elemental composition is a um, side. You can actually get the elemental composition. The pink in this case is iron rich, and the green is silicon rich, and that tells you a lot about your mineral that you might be mining or looking at. And there's also an application for chemical structure. This is the Raman spectroscopy I hope to cover later, where the elemental analysis will tell you there's silicon and oxygen. The Raman will tell you the binding characteristics of that and what the molecular spectroscopy looks at. So they're all powerful tools, and often they can be used together. The general idea, which we'll cover in more detail later, is the electron microscope consists of three main parts. That would be the electron column, and the electron column's function is to generate a small spot of electrons on the sample and then move that back and forth to build up the image. The sample is shown in the middle in green and that's where you hold the sample. The stage moves it around and tilts and does all sorts of things. And finally there's the detectors. Modern microscopes have many detectors in many different places so I'll go over those in detail. But you can do things like get an image, the structure function relationship, 
the elemental map for elemental analysis and you can do scattering through Raman to build up a better picture of what your sample is and why the sample you just prepared is better or worse than the sample you prepared yesterday. So that's the basic idea. Um, to put it all together, the most basic version of this is the idea that you have a beam coming from the top. It is deflected by the scan coils. So there are a pair of scan coils that deflect it left and deflect it right, and that forms a small spot on the sample. A signal is generated, generally because the number of electrons coming off, although there are many ways to generate signal, and then that beam is moved over one pixel, and the same thing happens again, and it moves over and happens again to build up the serial image as shown by the uh, grayscale blocks. It is a serial process. We're only illuminating one point at a time and we're collecting all the signal coming from that pixel and then integrating that to be a value of white. And that's how we build up our grayscale image. The number of detectors are quite large in the modern microscope, so we'll go over those in some more detail. But that's the general idea, is you have the beam coming down to the sample. You move the beam through its sweep. You correlate that with some grayscale value from a detector and that's your image. The um, interactions with electron microscopy are numerous, and these are some of the applications available to us on the 4800 SEM. We can do secondary electrons, which I'll cover, backscattered electrons, which are incredibly exciting. We can do Bremsdragen, which is a variation of x-rays. We can do characteristic x-rays, which unfortunately is not circled here, and we can also do transmitted in the inelastically and elastically scattered electrons, which is also not shown in this image. The uh, other microscope, the tungsten microscope, the 3400, has a few different features. It can also do secondary electrons. It can also do backscattered electrons. It can do EDS, so it can do the characteristic x-rays and the Bremsdragen. And in addition, it can do Raman spectroscopy with an optical probe and cathode luminescence. So there's a lot of different techniques we can. Depending on what detector we use and where we put that detector, we can get radically different signals and information from a various sample. So a lot of fun. And there we go. That's the image that shows the capabilities of the 4800. And this is the textbook you'll be using for this course. Now that we've covered some of the details of how the electron beam is formed up within the column, we need to think a little, about, little bit about how the electrons interact with the sample. What we're looking at here is the electron beam. The primary electron beam is coming down, interacting the sample in a plane. If we're able to look in cross-section, cut it in half and display that, that's what you see in the gray image. So that's the way the electrons are interacting with the sample. And it turns out that the energy of the electrons change the penetration volume and all sorts of very interesting things that we must understand before we can go further. So the most surface sensitive technique is called Auger spectroscopy. And it's extremely sensitive to all sorts of materials and oxidation states and all sorts of fantastic things. So I hope you get a chance to encounter Auger during your career. And uh, unfortunately, this technique is not available to us on these microscopes. A little bit deeper are the secondary electrons. And those are called the secondary electrons because you have the primary electron coming in quite fast, generally 5,000 to 30,000 volts, hitting the sample and interacting. There's a spray of secondary electrons from the surface. So the primary generates the secondary. And those are generally fairly low energy, on the order of 10 electron volts, but certainly less than 50 electron volts. So secondary electrons are being formed throughout this volume, but if you're 10 eV, two microns deep in the sample, there's no opportunity for you to reach the surface. So the electrons, the secondary electrons are really surface confined because if they're any deeper, they can't make their way out. So that's why we're able to do surface microscopy with the SEM. If we go a little bit deeper, as the primary electron interacts with the sample, there's a small probability that it will turn, it'll change its trajectory, and in some cases it can do multiple interactions and come back out. 
the original direction. And those are called backscatter electrons. They do lose some energy, so they're not purely elastic, but they ha certainly have enough energy to escape the sample and leave. Because the backscatter electrons are probing a much deeper volume, it gives you less surface morphology, like cuts and scratches, and it gives you more elemental composition. It turns out that the backscatter probability is not the same for all elements, so heavy elements will appear white, and lighter elements will appear dark in your image. So you can get some idea of the composition and grain structure from the backscatter electrons, where the surface uh, secondary electrons are just giving you the morphology. It's also possible for an X-ray to knock out a core shell electron, not a 10 volt electron, but more of a 8,000 volts electron, and leave a vacancy. With the Bohr shell, Bohr model of the electron, the vacancy at the low state is quantized, and there's orbitals above, which are also quantized, and you have a very specific energy difference, and that very specific energy difference can be released through an X-ray. So that's how we do X-ray spectroscopy, EDS, is we knock out a core shell electron, it collapses and goes back out. Because X-rays have a completely different transmission absorption coefficients in most materials from electrons, unfortunately the X-rays can come from quite deep in the sample. At 5,000 volts, 5 kV, this is generally in the order of one to three microns deep, so unfortunately EDS is not a surface technique as much as we would like it to be and EDS does not have the high resolution of the secondary electrons because you are probing a larger volume. So to drive this home I have a graph of number of electrons versus energy. You can see the first peak with the secondary electrons around 10. The OG electrons are in the middle. Again those are so surface sensitive they're generally not detected on our microscopes. And finally, you see a build leading up to the um, energy of excitation. So if you put in 5 kV, the best you can get out is 5 kV. And they all give you different information. So with an understanding of these two figures, we can move forward to pick out our detectors and get the volume probed, understood, and computated. So let's move forward. Um, there are some rules with electron microscopy. And the first rule is electrons do not travel well in air. They scatter or get absorbed. So you must work in a system that's evacuated to limit electron scattering. And that means that electron microscopes are generally vacuum tools, which have some special requirements. The sample has to be vacuum compatible, which is generally assumed to be dry. Although I have a variable pressure SEM that can work with things that are not completely dry. However, on the field emission tool, loading a wet sample is a huge mistake that risks damage to the microscope, which I'll cover later. The sample has to fit in the chamber. On my 3400, this is pretty relaxed. We can do um, 50 millimeters tall and 100 millimeters in diameter, a four inch wafer, although we can go up to a six inch wafer under special conditions. And because these are electron microscopes, we have to be electron conductive so the electrons don't pull at the sample and interfere with the beam. So we have to have a way for the electrons to get back to the stage, and that's generally done by working with metallic samples, applying a conductive layer, be it, cop be it um, platinum or carbon or gold, as you can see in some of these images, or operating the microscope in a way that neutralizes charge. So we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about minimizing charge when we talk about um, insulating samples. So the secondary electron signal to jump ahead is generally surface based because it's low kV, 10 volts or so, so they can only appear at the surface and it happens to be topo topological because if you have a flat surface you'll get generally the same electron signal but if you have a bump or an edge, you can get electrons coming out the top, which are detected, and you can get electrons coming out the side. So edges and slopes and all sorts of things become visible, and the little divots in this little guy, imaged on the 3400, appear dark because there's a lower electron yield.
So that's the basis for getting the topography, is you can see the electron yield changes with the topography and shape of the surface. Moving forward, there are some things you control within the electron column, and the most important is the condenser assembly. This is called condenser, it's called probe current, and it's called the C1 assembly on our various microscopes. And what you're able to do is you're able to control the size of the spot of the electron beam on the sample. If you're looking at something very large, you can use a large electron beam, which benefits from a large signal. But if you're looking for something quite small and you're using a large spot, you can't see it. So in the top image, you can see a small spot resolves all the little features in this diatom. And if you enlarge the spot, you get more signal, but you can see that those little divots are washed out. So it's important to match. If you're looking at a fairly large pixel with a fairly small spot, like the blue dot, you'll see that you don't get as much signal as you'd like. So it's important to balance these two ideas. If you're uh, looking at a higher resolution, as shown here by the finer grid, you can see that the red dot bleeds over into multiple spots where you'd want to scale to the blue dot, which is just the right size for the pixel. So this is a very important parameter to adjust. And what it is doing is it's changing the alignment of the condenser assembly, which I hope you'll cover later. At a large spot, you can see that most of the electrons go through to the sample, as shown by the um, diagonals. And only a few electrons, shown in gray, are lost. So there's an amazing signal here. However, electron beams are not perfect. They're quite far from perfect. So if we want to get high resolution, we have to throw away electrons which are not going to contribute to a small spot size, as shown in the second diagram, as highlighted here. And all those little gray electrons are lost. They hit the side of the microscope or the side of the chamber, and they don't contribute to the signal. So yes, you can get a smaller spot, but you end up losing signal through the electron density. So these are things that must be balanced. The signal to noise, this is a function of how many electrons you have versus the noise of the detector. If you have poor contrast, you can increase the current, which increases the spot size, depending on what size your sample is. You can decrease the detector gain, which introduces more noise. You can scan slower. These are the fast and slow scan mechanisms on the electron microscope, and those improve the signal by averaging longer. Or you can move over to the Ford 800 SEM, which is a field emission gun and is just simply brighter. Moving into some of the reasons that samples are difficult, the first one you're likely to encounter is charging. And charging is when the electrons are building up on the surface and influencing the beam. So if the electrons are disappearing from the sample, the beam comes in. If the electrons are pooling on the sample, they have a charge, a columbic charge through Q, and they can actually deflect the electron beam, which can do all sorts of extremely exciting things, like bright spots and dark spots. Your sample can drift, your sample can suddenly discharge, which gives you bands, and all sorts of extremely exciting things can happen. So the basic technique is to sputter, to metallize. If you can tolerate the damage to your sample, it's great to put platinum on it and that will give a conductive path to ground. You can decrease the accelerating voltage through the E2 point, which I'll cover a little bit later, or you can move to the variable pressure SCM. The idea there is a little bit of pressure in the chamber gives an additional pathway to neutralize charge. So I'm gonna break the approaches for difficult samples into four pieces and cover them in series. The idea is if you have one of these situations, what controls would you change on your microscope to better image these samples? So we'll start with depth of field. And this is for large macroscopic samples like the mosquito or large things where it has incredible geometry. It's very tall and you wanna get everything in focus at once. And there are a few techniques we have for this. It's the convergence angle and the working distance, which I'll cover in a moment. So 
The depth of field is really driven home in the optical microscope, where the optical microscope has a very narrow depth of field. Only things in the plane of focus are viewable, and things outside are blurry or out of focus, where the SCM really allows you to get the whole thing in focus. But there are some tricks. The idea of depth of field is you want to change your beam, which in an optical microscope is usually very diagonal, very high numerical aperture, you want to change it into a pencil, or as narrow as you can get through here. So the working distance is merely the distance from the objective to the sample. As you decrease that, you make the angle from broad to narrow. And the second thing is the angular, which is controlled through the uh, aperture which I'm not going to cover in detail here, but that's something you'll learn. It's a control on the side of the microscope that allows you to change the acceptance angle of the electrons. The basic idea there is you change the resolution, the number of electrons on the sample, but more things are in focus at a given time. So with this image, you can see a rough, a rough sample you can see the focus beam, and because the focus beam is very tight, very pencil-like, many things are in focus at the same time. The black bars indicate the um, picture element. So right at the middle, you have your sharpest spot, and at the black area, you have a little bit larger spot. But if that spot's okay, your sample will be in focus. So here's a large aperture with low focus. You can see that the top is in focus, but the bottom is not. Here's a large aperture. You can see that the focus has changed. And here's a small aperture with an intermediate focus. So you can see that most of this fracture element is in focus at the same time. So this one's a lot of fun. And if you end up doing large working distance, high depth of field, we can also do a three-dimensional technique using the red-blue glasses to make 3D images of the uh, height profiles, which is really fun. So come find me if that's what you're looking for. The second technique is resolution mode. This is something commonly used on the 4800, and this is to get the highest resolution possible, which means we need to work on getting the spot as small as possible. So again, this is through the condenser. The idea here is we need to make the spot small to be below the resolution or below the size of the feature we're looking at. And that's mainly through the condenser lens assembly. And we can start to point out some differences. So on the tungsten microscope, the tungsten filament is relatively large. It's 50 microns by 130 microns. So to demagnify, into a one nanometer spot, the condenser lens assembly has to work extremely hard. So what you find is that a tungsten microscope can go down to 10 nanometers, and in some cases as low as three. However, if you notice, the probe current has to remain fairly low. When you increase the probe current, you automatically increase the spot size on these microscopes. In contrast, there was a new technology called cold field emission, and that's what's incorporated into the 4800. The tip is smaller, typically on the order of a micron. So to focus to a one nanometer spot, the condenser lens assembly doesn't have to work nearly as hard, so it's much easier to make a small spot. Conversely, there's some very nice properties to this tip. As you increase current, you can see that there's a fairly linear regime at moderate currents. So you can actually get a pretty good signal with this tip. Now this is at 30 kV, which is the optimum resolution for the tungsten filament. And I think as we move down, you'll see there's a reason we do that. If you look at 30 kV, the tungsten filament's pretty good, 10 nanometer resolution, which generally incorporates to three on my microscope, the 3400. However, if we drop the tungsten microscope to one kV, you can see the resolution has followed, fall, fallen to 100 nanometers. So you're not able to do high resolution work. So that's why we always used to work at as high KV as possible. In contrast, you can see that the cold, emission, cold field emission microscope falls off. Yes, it is a larger spot at lower accelerating voltage, but it's not that bad. 
On the 4800, it's generally assumed that the resolution is one nanometer. That's the ability to determine that two objects are separated by. If they're closer than a nanometer, we can't see it, but they're larger than a nanometer, we can see that they're separated objects. And at, 100, at 1 kV, that resolution does fall, but it only falls to 1.4 nanometers. So it's not nearly as much of a drop off as it is with the tungsten filament. And that's yet another reason we like the field emission gun. So high resolution on the 3400, it can happen. It takes a little while and you have to do some pretty substantial modifications to the microscope and the operating parameters to get there, but it can be done. You need to have a short working distance. You need to have a very small probe current, generally 0%, where we're cutting out most of the electrons to only leave the, the very, very good spot forming electrons. You have to be at 30 kV, which is our highest current for smallest spot. You have to be at vacuum, not the um, variable pressure. And it takes a little while to get there. In contrast, the 4800 with the field emission gun has a smaller spot to begin with. So it's much, much easier to get higher resolution. You can get very good resolution at a number of working distances. Eight's my favorite. And you can go down. You can change the probe condenser. A uh, bigger number is a smaller spot. So five is standard, 10 is small. You can do 15 kV, which is much lower than 30, which allows you to see different uh, facets of the material using the what's called the upper secondary electron detector, which I'll cover. And you can operate in high vacuum. This sample's a gift. They're seven nanometers across and they're resolved quite clearly. Although we can make a better image than that these days. So the idea of the upper detector and lower detector on the 4800 follows from the principle of tracking the trajectory of the various electrons. So the secondary electrons come from near the primary electron. So the primary comes in and there's a small ring where the secondary electrons are produced. However, you can have a primary electron go quite far into the sample, come back up as a backscattered electron, and where it leaves the sample also generates secondary electrons. So the area of the secondary electrons can actually be quite big depending on what, det what detector you're looking at. So the idea of the through the lens detector is to increase the magnetic field so that you have the samples come down and then you have the secondary electrons come back up and because of the the pull piece where the electrons come out actually forms an aperture, you limit the detected volume to just near the primary electron. So this is the revolution that happened to give really high resolution beyond what the other microscopes can do. So if you look at the lower secondary electron detector, it's getting signal from the focal point, which is good. And it's also getting signal from all over the chamber including backscatter electrons that hit the side of the microscope, generate secondary electrons and are detected. So that one has a little bit of noise. And in contrast, the SE2s generated at the sample are directed by the magnetic field of the microscope up onto the upper detector, which gives higher resolution. The technology in the 4800 is called the EXB, which is the electron field crossed with the magnetic field. And the idea is that to operate the secondary electron detector, you need to apply a voltage to attract electrons to the detector, accelerate them so they can be detected, but that influences the or bends the primary beam coming through. So if you apply a magnetic field that distorts or corrects the beam positioning going down and corrects the primary beam as you can see in the straight line. Going backwards, when the secondary electrons come up through the optical system, the direction has changed, so your right hand rule has switched geometry and all of a sudden you have the electric field pulling the electrons towards the detector and you have the magnetic field pushing the electrons towards the detector. So you get an amplification of the electrons coming through. It's kind of a clever design.
This also has an advantage. When you're looking at secondary electrons, there are low energy. The, um, the secondary electrons right from the volume and there is a chance for the primary electron, the backscatter electron, to also be emitted and go through the aperture. So by clever control of the voltages, you can actually energy filter, which is shown as rejecting the backscatter electrons in blue in the first diagram, so they're absorbed into the microscope geometry. And the second geometry, the um, beam conditions are changed so that the secondary electrons are repulsed, but the backscattered electrons hit the microscope, generate secondary electrons, and those are detected by that. So you can actually get secondary electrons or backscattered as opposed to the limitation on a standard detector of having both of those present at all times. So it's a clever geometry. The next technique I'd like to move to is the low voltage mode. In the low voltage mode, you decrease the accelerating voltage as low as 500 volts, half a kV, all the way up to maybe 5 kV. And this changes the way that the electrons interact with the sample and can actually be used to great ability. So the main reason we use low voltage is the less energetic electrons don't penetrate as far into the sample, so you get a much smaller volume of interaction. So you can actually go from a fairly large volume at 30 kV all the way to a very narrow range. And that gives us some, some great features. So the spatial resolution improves because we're not exciting as big of a volume. The secondary electron yield rises, so it's actually a brighter sample as we go to lower kV. And you're putting fewer, well, less energetic electrons on the sample. So sometimes if you have charging, you just go to lower voltage and it works. Of course, if that doesn't work, go to higher voltage. So that's the idea of low energy. The interaction volume is controlled by two things. It's controlled by the energy of acceleration for the electron beam, and it's also controlled by the density of the material. If you're looking at a very light element like carbon, the sample can actually penetrate quite deeply, where if you switch over to gold, it's a very shallow level of interaction. So if we have low Z, like carbon, at low kV, you can see that there's a fairly large probe volume. And if we move to something like gold, a high, K, high Z at low kV, you can see that it becomes quite shallow. Likewise, at low Z, high kV, you get the biggest volume, and at high Z, high KV, it's somewhere in between. So you can control these and make them to your advantage, particularly if you have thin films or other features. There's a, another effect. The SE1 are the electrons immediately produced by the primary beam. SE2 are the electrons produced by other interactions like the backscatter electrons. And there's even higher order up like SC3, which is generated by collisions on the microscope, and so on. As you go to lower accelerating voltage, this um, witch's hat, as it's called, becomes quite flat. So it's easier to get resolution because you're only looking at electrons from the primary beam, not secondary interactions and all sorts of things. So the interaction volume shrinks quite dramatically. The interaction volume, the electrons at high energy, such as 5 kV here, can penetrate through the graphene flake or layer as shown. And you get kind of a transparent gummy bear or gummy worm appearance where you can actually start to see through the material. As you decrease to lower kV, here 1 kV, you can see that the material appears more solid and you get more of the features out of it. So as you change the the beam current, you dramatically change the volume of interaction, which can be used to your advantage. There's a little trick we used. It's called the E2 equivalency point. And if you're very careful and working with a very well-studied material, it's possible to get some idea of the electron yield. So at very low voltage, the electrons come in and they stick to the sample, and the sample builds up a negative charge if it's an insulator. At very high voltage, like 30 kV, the samples come in, or the electrons come in, they penetrate, stick, 
and build up a negative charge. However, in some materials that are widely studied, it's possible to find a voltage where the electron yield is actually greater than unity. So you put one electron in and you get 1.4 electrons out, and when that happens, the sample charges positively, which is very useful. So the E1 point is where we first cross the boundary from one, so the electron yield is equal. However, E1 is not stable. If it starts to charge negative, it drives more negative and causes problems. There's a, another equivalency point, E2, which is very useful, and that is actually stable. If you start to charge negatively, it ejects more samples, ejects more electrons towards the detector, and the charge evens out. So the E2 point is very convenient if you're studying things like chrome on glass masks, where you can't sputter coat them in platinum because that would ruin their performance. Or if you want to image a polymer without the problem, or all sorts of things. So E2 is a fun trick to learn. If you're, the way you find your E2 is you zoom in and scan for a little while, zoom out and take a note of what color the leftover box is. If it's darker, that means you're charging, charging positive. If it's brighter, that means you're charging negative, although there is some effect here for um, carbon deposition. And as you refine the accelerating voltage, you'll get pretty close to the E2 point for your material. You can actually work on things in high vacuum that are non-conductive and image them in great detail. So it's a fun trick. The uh, penetration depth can be shown here with the TEM grid. At 30 kV, the sample is quite transparent. You can see the windows of carbon on the copper grid. And if you go to something lower, like 1 kV, you can see that the carbon grid is now visible on top of the um, copper support. So lots of fun things we can do here. We can actually start to image small things, transparent things, thin things, by just changing the accelerating voltage. The high energy image, so this is a, a microfabricated device. You can see the little connections and gateways. At high voltage, you can see that some of the structure is apparent, some of the edges you can see in the sample, and it kind of gives a pseudo 3D representation, and you can see how it's wired. If we go to low KV, you can see that much of the morphology is removed, but we get a very good idea of the defects, the contamination, the dirtiness, and all the other sorts of things on the sample, which you just can't see in the other image. So, Use this to your advantage as you change the accelerating voltage, you change the probe volume. As you change the probe volume, you change what you're looking at in the sample. So, quite a fun technique. The final method is kind of the go-to. If you're not doing high resolution, you might as well be operating high beam current. This gives you the best signal, of course, because you're putting the most electrons on the sample. And the idea is to make the beam large, to get as many electrons on the sample as you can, and there's some ways you do that. So, to get back to the idea, if you're imaging at 1000x, you have a very large pixel. Why not increase the diameter of the beam to match the pixel size and give you as much signal as you can? Because that's a great way to do it. If you're doing with a small spot, you're not getting any higher resolution because you can see the pixel size is now much larger than the spot, so you're just dealing with less current. The other reason to go for high current mode is the elemental analysis. The number of x-rays coming out is proportional to the number of electrons coming in, so if you're doing EDS, you might as well be operating at high current to give you as many x-rays to detect as possible, and since EDS is not a high resolution technique, generally not accurate above 10,000 X, you might as well be in the high probe current geometry anyways. So this is the end of my initial portion of the talk, and the idea is to cover some of the ways you approach difficult samples. I have additional segments on a number of other topics, like scanning transmission electron microscopy. This is a variant of TEM, 
where we look at the secondary electrons coming off in the 4800, but we also have a detector located underneath that looks at the transmit electrons. So that's a lot of fun. We have a lot of other detectors. I did not go into the backscatter geometry and all that entails, but both these microscopes have backscatter detectors. We do elemental mapping on both samples, and we do spectroscopy. We can get the chemical composition at a point, but these detectors are so fast you can actually change the beam and look for the signal as a function of time and actually build up a map so you get the composition as a function of position. There's Raman, which is a molecular spectroscopy tool that tells you a lot about the composition. Not only the composition in terms of what elements are present in large amounts, but also how they're chemically bonding and interacting with each other. So that's one of my favorite techniques. There's variable pressure, which is yet another technique to removing charging when working on insulating samples that's present on the 3400 SEM. And then there's full-on transmission electron microscopy. The TEM in USEF is 200 kV. It's able to form a much, much smaller spot, traditionally on the order of angstroms, and give great high-resolution images of your sample down to the lattice spacing or the atomic packing. So that's a, another tool that goes beyond the resolution of these microscopes and really pushes forward. So these are all segments I can talk about in the future. Thank you very much for your time.